Hi. Um. So welcome to our first panel, which is on economic security, as you already heard. Um, I have the pleasure to welcome on stage Jovita Nielupcene, who is the uh, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs from Lithuania. Carl Bild from the ECFR and Jim O'Brien, who's uh, responsible for sanctions coordination at the US State Department. You see one empty chair, which is for Arancha Gonzalez Laya, um, who's a bit late, uh, stuck in the train, but it's coming later. And we'll just start and um, she'll join us in a bit. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask you, Jovita. Um, we just saw the polling data. Um, Europeans don't seem to have much appetite um, for a conflict with China or even de-risking the relationship with China, which I found surprising. Um, now, you, your country, Lithuania, has had a very tense relationship, economic relationship recently with China um, over your ties with Taiwan, but also um, China's economic coercion. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what's your reaction to these data and also does it reflect um, your experience with uh, other EU leaders? Well, first of all, uh, we probably have uh, not to stick too much to their, uh, uh, their de-risking, decoupling. I think that uh, de-risking is already happening because I still believe that uh, we all uh, in, their, in, their, uh, in the political establishment, but as well the people, uh, we have uh, learned the lessons. And uh, uh, I know that people just don't like those who, who say that we told you so. So uh, people saw what, uh, what happened uh, with, uh, with our uh, relations with Russia and if you, you know, if we go back, went back uh, 2020 or maybe 2018 and ask if there is a potential risk uh, that or that uh, 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 buying re energy resources from Russia, do we have to decouple or de-risking? I would say that majority of the people would probably saying, no, we still have to have a partnership with, uh, with Russia. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, the the problem is the the further you are the way the the more complicated uh, is uh, is uh, probably to to evaluate situation. By the you way, you mean the further away uh, yeah, geographically? Yeah. Yes, uh, of course. And uh, and if uh, we go back in the same, uh, for example, 2018, I don't know if uh, many people in this hall remember what happened uh, in that year in the EU. Actually, we uh, decided not to prolong the uh, the anti-dumping measures for China solar panels. Mm. What happens uh, next? Uh, in, within the three years, we lost 75% of the global market in solar panels. In uh, 2018, nobody thought that solar panels has something kind of their strategic importance for our economy. Look what is happening right now. If we would have this part of, uh, of the global market, probably we will not be so much dependent on, uh, on Russia. So I, uh, on, on, on China and on Russia, because we were depending on the fossil fuels, uh, not developing uh, uh, renewables. So much. Well, actually, a lot of people were warning. Even I, I remember exactly. uh, Emmanuel Macron back then, when he was still a minister, he was very much in favor of these anti-dumping yeah. tariffs. But um, well, we were on the, Germany uh, was uh, against. Yeah, we were on the on the same seat uh, at, uh, at, at that moment uh, with uh, with France. But luckily for us, in uh, in uh, in Lithuania, solar panel industry survived. Now we're investing in Italy. That's uh, that's fine with us. But as I said, nobody likes uh, those. Uh, uh, those who, t uh, who told you uh, something that uh, you don't believe at the moment. You know, in uh, uh, 2022, our uh, exports to, to China went uh, pr probably to, to zero. Mm. And uh, uh, we really appreciate all the European support and that EU and the European Commission actually stood uh, by us and gave a, a really a shoulder when we needed. But uh, I think that uh, there, uh, the problem was that we didn't have a proper instruments how we should react right. to those kind of the but situations. Was it, was it really just the instruments? Or coming to my second part of the question, was it also a lack of will? I mean, not, not at the commission, as you say, the commission actually wanted to back Lithuania in this, in this confrontation with China. But from Germany, France, was there really that much support for for Lithuania and this economic confrontation? 
I think that uh, there was enough support in, in a way that it was very clear understanding, but uh, that uh, you know, if uh, China would use this as an example to have a push and uh, exert the, uh, the economic pressure on the whole single market. Mm. That will uh, uh, that will show an example that actually you can do this, mm. even if you have 500 uh, uh, of the market, 500,000 uh, people of, of the market, you still can be pushed uh, uh, pushed around. And uh, uh, well, probably this would help to mobilize uh, uh, mobilize the will. But you but you are right. You have to have instruments. So anyway, you have to have them. Uh, and uh, the trade defense instruments was not uh, was obviously not enough. Uh, so I'm happy that uh, the, the Parliament, Commission, and Council finally reached uh, the, the political uh, yeah. political decision. I, I, I want to ask uh, Carl Bildt the same question, but just basically to summarize, you're saying uh, on these on these polling data, okay, but let's not take it too seriously because the situation could could change at any moment and. Uh, I think that uh, one of the very indicative question is when you ask the public uh, what should happen if uh, China starts to supply uh, uh, military equipment for Russia, you see the, the answer actually changes. So I think that we have to have trust in people. They, when they see the real crisis coming, I do believe that you know, the, 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 uh, the opinion, the, the mood will change. But meaning that we should also prepare even though people sure. don't want to prepare sure. already. Um, Carl, the same question. What's your reaction to these polling data? Well, I'd be hardly surprised here. I would say foreign policy is not done by opinion polls. We have an <laughs> ongoing debate about that at the ECFR board. Um, it is done by thinking ahead what kind of policies should work at any given time and then provide a leadership to public opinion. So, so I would say that the policymakers should not be shaped by public opinion, but should shape public opinion. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, some of these polling data, when you look at them, particularly when it comes to relationship with Russia, does reflect historical things. Bulgaria, for other reasons, have another attitude to Russia than, say, Sweden or Finland. Uh, that's a function of geography and history more than any uh, Lithuania could have been added to that particular picture. Then a ref reflection on anything that is happening at this particular time. Uh, but let me just make some remarks um, on the, the, the entire subject. One is, um, I mean, there's a, there's a tendency which I'm sort of uh, fairly worried about, uh, the weaponization of trade um, that we see. Um, that's done by several actors, not least by us as uh, an instrument of pol foreign policy. And my argument would be that it rarely, as an isolated foreign policy instrument, it is very rare to see that it produces any effects. I mean, the Lithuania... So do, you, do you mean sanctions or do you mean trade? Or whatever. Yeah. I mean, there are different things. Yeah. I mean, Lithuania is a case to the point. Mm. Uh, what the Chinese did to Lithuania, they did in any sort of way affect the foreign policy of Lithuania. Not that I can detect anyhow. Mm. Uh, and that was a very big actor against, sorry to say, a fairly small nation. It didn't work. Um, so the weaponization of trade is a very blunt instrument, which rarely in isolation works. Um, we use that quite often in the West, sanctions it's called in that particular case, and if worked, if integrated with other measures and part of an overall policy, it could have an effect. But in itself, it's a fairly useless and sometimes counterproductive policy. I That's think. my first point. Yeah. The second point, um, I mean, there's a price to be paid for sort of a trend towards mercantilism or whatever we have at the moment. Um, to take another that you brought up, the solar panel issue. Um, true, uh, we had these uh, measures against them. True, we took them away because we couldn't really prove uh, in the court, the WTO, um, that it was subsidies that led to this. And what has happened since then, true, the Chinese have captured the market, but if I remember the figures right, prices are down 70%, which means that the global competition has driven technology forward and prices down and has accelerated the, the transition, the green transition. That's, in my opinion, a good thing. Uh, and we will face the same issue, by the way, 
when we now have the entire uh, EV uh, electric vehicles where mm. some of us were at the previous meetings uh, where the Chinese are now six, seven years ahead of us. Uh, what do we do with that? Do we block their cars? Well, we could do that and say they're subsidized, whether they are or not, we can discuss. Uh, but that will mean that we would have a slower transition to electric vehicles in Europe. Is that a good or a bad thing? I mean, there's a downside to this particular thing. I mean, last last yeah. point before uh, finishing. Uh, we now find the entire debate drifting from decoupling everyone is against to de-risking everyone is in favor. I'm in favor, but I would argue that de-risking is done any single board company that I've been aware of do de-risking on a daily, well, if not on a daily, but a regular basis. Because business is a question of maximizing opportunities and minimizing risks. So any company that is worth its salt does de-risking all the time. And the sum of the de-risking activities of the different economic actors becomes the de-risking of the national economy. And these things are changing, of course. Uh, they read newspapers uh, and they do their own analysis. They try to maximize the opportunities wherever those are and they try to minimize their risks. And we are in a situation where geopolitical risks are increasing. So there's a risk of not taking that into account. There's also significant risk of overdoing it because then you lose opportunities that will be picked up by others. I mean, you said basically sanctions are useless, or I think no. you actually said it verbatim. No, um, <laughs> no, I said as, as an isolated instrument, and I've been sort of sitting through endless right. meetings in the EU of that. Right. We, we tend sometimes to do sanctions as a substitute for policy. I can support sanctions as an integrated part of policy, but as a substitute for policy, which we I, I don't think anyone anymore. would What's argue we should do that? sanctions alone, but it is, is can, can the EU do, let's put it, let's, let's ask yes, uh, the question in reverse, can the EU do much more than sanctions policy because the only big lever that the EU has is its single market, right? It doesn't have an army. I mean, it can, it can, it can distribute money. Um, no, 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 that's, that's sometimes the case. I mean, remember to take one example where we've been, uh, uh, say, sanctions against Syria. Hmm. Did it have any effect? I don't know. Sanctions against Iran, has they moved Iranian policy? I don't know. Perhaps it did on the margins, uh, but it's not been enough. Mm. I mean, negotiations are probably in, but, but, but the there, there have been... Of the sorry. sanctions or of the policy as a whole, right? Once, once you, you integrate sanctions to a policy, you have sure. to evaluate the whole policy and all the instruments and, the and not just say it's about sanctions. Mm. Sorry. No, I actually, I saw you reacting to, um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're responsible for sanctions coordination, so I assume you have a, a view on this. Um, <laughs> Welcome. But, ah, uh, excellent. This is what I call a grand entrance. I think yes. it's good. Why don't you answer the question? Um, <laughs> you, you, you joined, you Whatever it is, it's no. <laughs> You joined in the perfect moment because we're in the heat of debate of whether, uh, basically, of uh, whether sanctions policy um, is, can be effective. Um, and um, Carl, Carl argues that um, no, basically. Um, and I was just going to ask Tim, <laughs> since that's his job. Um, well, I, I'm the ambassador for sanctions coordination, not just for more sanctions. So I actually agree with Carl's. Um, fundamental point. And when we first worked together years ago in Bosnia, a major part of the effort was to link sanctions and ultimately their relief to specific changes in behavior that were required. And, and that's, you know, there it was documented and signed by everyone. It's rare that it's that clear. But in general, that's the approach that we want to take. And, and I mean, maybe I mean, my concern with the poll numbers, and I think I'm largely where Jovita is, there's an abstract quality to mm. some of the discussion. If you just ask people on the street, you know, are you for de-risking? 
That just sounds like a no. I'd rather just have healthy behavior and not have to, you know. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, I'm going to wander off into things for the uh, no, after hours it's a, sessions. It's, it's a good point the, because Carl yeah. said, um, you know, politicians shouldn't react to public opinion, but should shape public opinion. Isn't this actually a reflection of this shaping of public opinion? Well, and I think yeah. that's the critical point, yeah. right? So, I, I mean, I'll just say in general with politics. I mean, my view on the country I know best is that for the last decade or two, our politics is making us talk only about the issues that divide us or scare us. And that puts us in the habit of disagreeing as well when we're talking about issues where we don't normally um, have any real disagreement. I think fundamentally, if you look at US politics, under the surface, there's emerging, I think, a much more um, solid kind of socially aware set of policies and public attitudes that gets colored in the polarization because at the moment we haven't had a politician, although President Biden is doing much of this work, we haven't had a politician who's captured the public imagination to say, let's talk about the issues on which we do agree. And I think that's the piece, to your point, Jakob, that what we need now is to talk to our publics about what we want them to join us in supporting. And I think what we're doing is, is building a rule abiding, a rule based community of countries that's dedicated to supporting the UN Charter, standing up for human rights, but also preparing ourselves for three huge transitions in our economies coming up in biomedical research, the Green Revolution that Carl mentioned, artificial intelligence. And that's real work that's happening between the governments at the moment. And it's a positive agenda, but it's not yet what we talk about as what we want our people to come together around. When you say to them, when you go back to these same poll uh, recipients um, and ask them in a few years, if you say to them, do you want more jobs in the renewable energy industry? Do you want more chip manufacturer? Do you want more domestic manufacturer of EVs? Um, and China seems not want to want to play with that. What's your attitude toward China now? Then I agree with Jovita. I think you get a sense of, hey, these guys aren't playing by a set of fair rules. Now, I can go on now. How do sanctions work as a part of this? I think there we do look at Russia. And again, I, I agree with Jovita. Look, one of the points, Secretary Blinken just gave a speech in Helsinki. To, OK, sorry, well, I'll stop there. Yeah. I, I just want to make a distinction because we, we're kind of between sanctions and de-risking because it's not the same thing. I mean, both mean in some way a bit less trade with Russia or China. But, but, but with very different um, ob objectives in mind, right? Um, actually, de-risking is probably defending yourself against the possibility of sanctions. And in the case of Russia, you could argue um, the threat of Russia cutting gas to Europe actually was a very powerful political tool that Russia had until it, until it used it. But um, until then... What would um, happen if uh, China cuts uh, lithium uh, uh, export? So, so you could argue maybe sanctions work as a, as a threat at least. But, but let's talk about sanctions in a little bit. I just want to go back to the idea of de-risking. And Arantxa, you, you've, seen the, you've seen the polling data. Um, not so much appetite for de-risking. Now the question is, um, what does that really mean? And it, it, isn't, isn't the whole debate also framed in a way as if Europeans had a choice there's just this kind of game that the US and China are playing and we can choose whether we want to join when in fact, aren't we already suffering from China's state capitalism and, and are part of it whether we want it or not? And also if China attacked Taiwan, wouldn't we be part of it, of the consequences whether we wanted it or not? So um, I happen to think that uh, polls and listening to citizens in democracies is very important. <laughs> So now we may like or not like what they tell us, but I do think that it's kind of good to listen to their views. And kudos for this work that has been done. It's very interesting to read uh, this report. I've uh, spent uh, the two hours plus that Air France and Orlando uh, Airport <laughs> gave us uh, glancing through uh, the polls because I think what it tells us is that European citizens imperfect as their view may be, feel three things. They feel we have to uh, pretty firm with Russia. They tell us that we've got to be nuanced 
with China. And they tell us that we've got, realist, we've got to be realistic vis-a-vis -vis the US. And I do think that this actually is pretty well relates to the concept of European open strategic autonomy. Now, in some countries, it's a little bit more open. In some others, it's a little bit, on, bit more on the strategic. How much is uh, partnership, how much is competitor, how much is rival. And in other countries, it's uh, more about uh, the autonomy piece. But by and large, frankly, reading those polls, I felt reassured that this idea that we are looking for open strategic autonomy is supported by European citizens. And what they are telling us, and for us in Europe, we've got to be listening carefully, is that Europeans want a Europe in the world. They want a specific lane in international affairs for European and Europeans' view. Now, then the question is, how do we translate this, not now, but for the future? What does the European policymaker, what do European politicians do uh, about making sure that this is the model for the future and that Europe would be able to swim as a specific actor in the world, not now, but in 20, 30, 50 years on. And there is where Europeans uh, have to, uh, politicians uh, have to be uh, now deploying a set of tools, thinking of uh, working with a set of partners uh, to make this uh, work, not now again, now uh, this seems to be uh, where we are swimming, but now is a very specific circumstance. We need to be working on this uh, for the future. Now, to, to go back to uh, the question you just raised uh, a moment ago, I wouldn't say that European citizens don't want to do the risk. I would say that they've got a more nuanced view of the risking than other views on the market. That's how I would put it. Now, again, it's for all of us uh, together in Europe to have this conversation and translate this much more into a strategy. So to your point, um, more appetite for strategic autonomy, for European, whatever that is, whatever that is but for clearly for a European uh, role in, in between these two powers. Um, now, the Commission is actually coming forward in two weeks, on June the 20th, with its own economic security doctrine. Um, Jovita, what, what can we expect? Protect, um, promote, and partnerships. That's the key words the Commission is, is using, and I think that uh, probably it uh, really captured, uh, uh, captures uh, the, uh, the public opinion poll in, uh, in, in Europe. But uh, the, the question uh, will be always, you know, uh, what to protect and how. Yeah. What? And, what does it really mean? Uh, what does it really mean? Do we uh, speaking actually of strengthening our own um, uh, investment screenings? Mm -hmm. We started from, uh, well, quite squ uh, square zero uh, four or five years ago. Now we have some kind of the framework. Should we look into the outbound investments? As, uh, well, I think we will be becoming under, uh, under quite uh, pressure to make sure that, you know, the technologies we are right now, we're in the very much into, uh, in advance as Europeans actually can leak you know we were speaking about carbon leakage for uh, for two decades maybe now we have to really think about the technology leakage which is uh, which is happening and i, I can man uh, mention uh, lots of uh, um, uh, lots of examples some of uh, uh, of them are from here uh, be it nokia be it ericsson hmm, mm. in china um, so uh, i would uh, definitely uh, probably there are p more people knowledgeable about those cases in the, in the, in the in the in the audience uh, and uh, uh, of course well it depends then uh, it comes to the nuances what uh, part uh, Europe you are speaking uh, speaking with uh, and uh, there probably we will land uh, some uh, somewhere speaking about uh, promote 
well, I don't really know whatever uh, other uh, part of, of the world which would be so pro-trade, so open trade, uh, so really very much into their uh, promoting uh, really the, the rules how, uh, how we trade. But here I come back, you know, what, do we have really all the, all the inf instruments and do we really trust uh, the partners we trade and uh, do we uh, really sometimes when we see unfair trade, do we want and have well to enforce uh, those, uh, those instruments? So it's not about sanctions, uh, as, as, as Carl said, but it's really as the one part of the policy because, you know, you cannot be toothless in, uh, in your discussion. And the other and the last point is, of course, about the partnership. Do you trade with everyone openly, wherever you go and you let, you know, take a uh, business uh, all full uh, risk? Or do you really trust with those partners who are more rule-based and, you know, uh, rule of law, uh, international, all their, all their uh, uh, attire to all the international regulations? Or you think that, you know, it's uh, easier to do uh, really big profits in the short, uh, short run and then forget, uh, forget the future? Now, um, Tobias Gerke and Julian Ringhoff argue in their paper that um, there should be, the EU should use, make more use of export controls. You also mentioned outbound, outbound investment screening, which might be part of the Commission's proposal. Let's talk about that in a second, because that's a whole new kind of worms. But let's talk first about export controls, because they're mentioned in this ECFR paper. Um, Carl, do you agree that that's something that the EU should be using more? We have that. Uh, we've had that for a long time in terms of uh, technologies. There's been a regime in place through, uh, through the Cold War. I was responsible in this country for overseeing it. Uh, so it's a fairly thorough screening of certain technologies that we consider key. Uh, dual use? Well, yeah, and that's always uh, somewhat, I can say it's fairly tricky sometimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, to uh, judge and there's an international list that is agreed. Uh, there's been a problem now with updating that for a number of reasons. Uh, but the export control regime for key technologies has been in place for a very long time. Um, now the question is, should we make more aggressive use of it to uh, protect certain, you know, the, 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 the innovative edge that the EU still has in certain fields. Uh, yeah, but our problem is, uh, I'm, yeah, to some extent, but let, let, let me add, you say, the innovative edge that we have. I've, I've had reason to look at more details in the car industry. Um, and let me explain why. Uh, we have the, the, the biggest private employer in this particular country is Volvo, cars. Yeah. The biggest private. Uh, it was sold by the Swedes some years ago to the Americans. And it's Chinese owned. Now. And then the Americans sold it to the Chinese, the Ford Motor Corporation in this particular case. Why uh, are you looking at me? No, 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 no. no I, I was looking at the wall. It wasn't you, Jim. It wasn't you. But, but, but the key point is, is another one that's interesting. There's no question that the Chinese, Geely is the firm, had use of the intellectual property on, on coming from Volvo in setting up large manufacturing in China and becoming fairly significant in China. Now it's shifting. Now we need the intellectual property of the Chinese mm. because they're so ahead of us in terms or of these particular for batteries. Thing. Not only for batteries, I mean, even more for the digital thing of it. I mean, they're two, three years ahead of us in batteries. They're six, seven years ahead of us in where. So we need the IP coming from the Chinese for our car industry to survive. Um, I'm in favor of an intellectual interchange, so, so I'm not against this. I'm just saying that we should be aware of the fact that when we say the Chinese are stealing IP, no question, but we also, and, and we should be aware of our dependence on raw materials and whatever, but increasingly we're going to be dependent on IP mm. coming out of China. And the way to handle this long term, and there's only one in my opinion, is we must be far more aggressive in research and development and competitiveness, because there's no way that we can regulate ourselves right. out of being non-competitive with what the Chinese can produce. I mean, and, and, um, that's what you hear sometimes coming out of Washington as yeah. well, yeah. Uh, which I think is the right policy approach.
But even, I mean, I, I would I'll argue... I'm looking at you, <laughs> but, but, but as a follow-up, why, why... You could argue, um, okay, the Chinese are better at making electric cars. Let them. Um, why, does, why does every continent need to make batteries, cars, chips? Don't we risk running into the same problems that we ran into when, when, when politicians decided what we have to produce, namely steel, which is a global overcapacity, and then new trade wars, everybody making way too many batteries, way too many chips. True. True. I mean, in, in, in terms of batteries, of course, where these stations have what, 80, 80, 90% of the market. Uh, but we are still investing quite a lot uh, because there's a transport cost and things like that. So, so there, there's an advantage in having these huge facilities fairly close to where we assemble the cars. Mm. Um, so if, even if we have that dependency, it makes sense. In I mean, we are investing, I think, in three new big factories in this country, for example. Or we are not. They are. Uh, the so-called capitalists. <laughs> well, with a lot of with a lot of money, I don't know in the case of Sweden, but definitely uh, in Europe, there's a lot of money coming now um, from from taxpayers basically to subsidize these battery factories. In, in Sweden, it's the capitalists. <laughs> <laughs> so that means that there is a business case, um, at least uh, for these ones, um, I suppose. Um, now, same question, Jim. Export controls, um, and not not for not as as a sanctions tool, but as a as a as a as a tool to kind of protect certain technological advantages. Um, is that is that something that the U.S. will bet more on? I'm the sanctions guy. The um, I think export controls have emerged over the last decade as a renewed um, and incredibly important tool of policy. So they're at the heart of our answer to Russia's invasion. Um, I think using them for purely mercantilist purposes is sort of, I don't believe that's the motivating uh, piece of their use in context other than war and peace. What we're looking at is, you know, if there's illegitimate um, use of IP or, or intrusions on um, things that threaten our security, then an export control is an appropriate tool. And I, I really, I like what Arantxa said. I can call you Arantxa, right? I'm Jim. Okay. The, um, I, that I think this goes to what we mean when we talk about something under de-risking um, or however we phrase it. I think, I think popular support for the idea is actually really nuanced um, and kind of context dependent. And that's, in fact, what U.S. policy is. I mean, what's ironic is the discussion about China comes as this fear that the U.S. and China are sort of treading inevitably toward a great power competition. In fact, you know, our trade went up. Our engagement with China is something we very much want. We talk about investing, aligning, and competing with China. And so it's, it, it's a very nuanced approach that that as the context shifts, I think the popular support comes with it. Um, and I just, I, so though I, I like that we've asked and found a snapshot of where the public is, kind of where it goes depends a lot on the context that leaders choose to put in front of them. That's where the kind of things about investment screening, bringing jobs home, protecting our ability to keep our economies running gives you a very different context of what it will look like to be working with China than, than with something else. And that goes to, you know, are people going to be with us going to Taiwan? Well, a simple point that we realized in the pandemic is that if everything's made in China, sometimes it's hard for that stuff to get to the markets. So if you want to say everything, you know, all electric cars should be made in China, if China chooses to go after Taiwan, those ships aren't coming through and they're not going to drive those new Chinese made Volvos, you know, across the steppes of Central Asia. So it, really everybody has an interest in um, in seeing us operate in this kind of nuanced way, where we're protecting what we need, but cooperating wherever we can. And the question is where you stop, right? Like if you if you have certain industries that you can define, and you say we really need to have those, but our cars part of it, our solar panels part of it. Like you yeah, well, I think you know I alluded to this, and Carl did as well. I think Jake Sullivan. I think the most important speech by someone other right. than the president last fall said there are three technologies that will drive economic growth and prosperity Chips. over the it's it's artificial intelligence is sectors artificial intelligence biomedical advances and the green revolution 
And that's where it's innovations in those areas that will shape the future. And so our rule abiding community of countries is oriented to make sure we can thrive in those sectors. Now, exactly what tools you use for different points, there are a lot of people more expert than, than I am. Okay, I mean, and, and, and so, to summarize the, the, the answer to the first question, basically export controls can work well as sanctions and are being used against Russia. Um, so let's, let's pivot to, the, to, to, to actually talking about sanctions um, and less about uh, de-risking. We can go back, but um, I, I, I really wanted to ask you about sanctions um, because for the first time, or let's say more than ever before, the US and EU have really coordinated their approach on, on, on Russia. And this has been seen as part of the success. But also now more and more, we're talking about actually the loopholes and where the sanctions are not being as effective as, as was initially hoped. Um, so my question to you, Jim, is first, what have you learned from this cooperation between the EU and US? Um, and maybe later about the circumvention. Um, so, the primary point from a U.S. perspective is that we welcome there being more capacity in the EU or across Europe to engage with us on problems, especially global problems. And that, the EU already has this on many economic measures. The partnership on export controls and sanctions in response to Russia is fabulous. Jovita and I spend a lot of time in meetings where we're coordinating and looking at sectors. Um, and I think more f ability to operate foreign policy. The whole purpose of the 2% of GDP commitment for, for NATO members is to make sure that we actually have the ability to respond when there are crises. So that, I think, is the, the core lesson. And I'm happy to go into detail about Russia, but I've been talking a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Same question to you, Ita, because you, you've also worked on sanctions. Um, what have we learned from this cooperation? I mean, part of it, I think, was the EU wanting to prevent the US from using ex extraterritorial sanctions. Um, and are we reaching the limits of what can be done without extraterritorial sanctions? Sky is the limit for Lithuania. In sanctions, <laughs> uh, sanctioning Russia, that's for sure. And uh, you would probably have a really a good uh, opinion, Paul, if you ask if we need more sanctions in Lithuania. So uh, <laughs> you get 98% of uh, saying yes. Uh, have we reached the limits? Uh, definitely, uh, definitely no. 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 I, I mean, limits with what we're doing right now, which is not extraterritorial sanctions, because the EU clearly now, we're, preparing the 11 sanctions package, it's all about circumvention, because we're seeing that um, without extraterritorial, so without sanctions, just extraterritorial sanctions, meaning yes. sanctions that apply to companies outside of your own jurisdiction, and the US has used that in the past, for example, on Iran, and it's meant that EU companies, even though the EU wanted them to keep trading with Iran, um, had to stop trading or lose access to the US market and, and risk penalties. So. We've not done this against Russia. Um, is that a problem now? Because we're seeing that a lot of countries, such as Kazakhstan, are actually circumventing or even encouraging EU companies in, in circumventing these sanctions. Actually, we're done. We, we have uh, secondary sanctions. But not... But uh, because uh, what is uh, what is happening in EU since the uh, ninth package right now we're yeah. negotiating 11th for, but uh, since ninth package we actually have a possibility to sanction anyone and everyone even outside our jurisdiction if they help to circumvent the sanctions we have the so-called annex 7 which mm. you can put uh, the company names or or, or, or people's names uh, in uh, in there so uh, theoretically we have and we actually have uh, some uh, some companies on the list and uh, some of those companies are Iranian companies by the way so it's right. uh, so, uh, so, it's, so, true. so it was done we, on Iran yeah, yeah. for the drones we start, but yeah we started uh, we started it uh, now we are in the negotiations if we can actually start putting countries not really you know their physical persons or, uh, or, or or companies but countries on the list and here we have the you know the, the negotiations uh, internal EU negotiations if we really want to do what kind of if should be a first resort 
Hmm? My country would say, yes, we do everyone <laughs> who is helping Russia, we put on the list. But you know, there are other countries who would say like, okay, there should be a last resort and we have to have a clear, uh, clear pathways how we, do, uh, how we do that. So I really go, uh, hope and keep my fingers crossed that we actually can, uh, can manage that. And I, as always, with all the instruments you, you create, the new instruments you create, be it trade or be it sanctions, you have to have them as the once the preventive measure you know, it does not really very much for me, well, it is important to put someone on the sanction list, but you know, to have a possibility and to say, look, guys, you know, it cannot be that, you know, let's take one example. Uh, with Jim, we, uh, we have some kind of a series of numbers we usually use is like 80, uh, 8442. I would say the, circuit, uh, the processor, circuit, circuit pros processor, well, anyway, processor. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and goods related, uh, related uh, to that. You know, it's not in the dual use, which we uh, actually, the yes. good instrument and uh, so on and so forth, but it's a part of the high technology. And uh, increase of EU trade with Kazakhstan on this particular processor is dramatic. US trade uh, on this particular processor is as well went upside. What happened next? Kazakhstan trade with Russia on this particular processor increased 86%. And the problem with this specific processor, they can, this can be used in their uh, missile caliber. I'm sure everybody learned by now, actually since uh, 24th of February, what does it mean? It means life uh, of, of people, which are shot uh, uh, every, almost every, every day. So, you know, this is where actually we why we have to have a certain level of secondary sanctions or extraterritorial mm. sanctions, but, but as you say. Until now, the Commission has always refused to even consider secondary sanctions because they say that's something that we don't want to be used against us, so we would never use it against others. Uh, Adanta, you've, you've, you've been Spain's foreign minister in the past. You, you, you also know about the, these problems and the, this discussion. Um, do you think that we wouldn't have the problems now with circumvention if we had secondary sanctions, for example, for um, Greek companies that are still shipping Russian oil. Look, let's face it, um, and this is, a, this is an uncomfortable discussion. Uh, so let's face that this is an uncomfortable conversation. That's why I'm asking the question. Okay, so sanctions are necessary. They are necessary because they, we take a stance when we see something that we think is egregious. And it's a good way to say, we are drawing a line in the sand. Let's say that we have a bit of a difficult uh, relationship to sanctions because we've been also affected by secondary sanctions. But what we are doing in Russia is sending a very clear signal that we're drawing a line in the sand. And these sanctions, they may not be perfect, but they have had an impact. They've had an impact of depriving Russian actors of uh, the means they had, they have, to wage a war against a neighbor, a war that we consider to be an illegitimate war. Right. So that part, so far so good. It's a necessary ingredient in the toolbox, but it's an insufficient mm -hmm. ingredient in the toolbox. Sanctions are not a substitute for engaging with third countries. Sanctions are not a substitute for talking to other countries who see in the current situation an opportunity to buy cheaper oil, okay. who's going to fuel their economy. So, so what we cannot is we need to have the sanction, which is one tool in our toolbox, but also very... Uh, thorough engagement with our partners and engaging with the partners, uh, sorry, and uh, uh, I'll finish with this, means also being sensitive to the problems that our partners have. Mm -hmm. But I just want to make sure I understand your point. You're saying no secondary sanctions, but talking to the countries that are encouraging circumvention or, or at least Look, I mean, allowing it. The, the sanctions that we have on the toolbox are, in my view, as good as sanctions will be. We need to obviously keep insisting on working with the partners. I mean, we can tighten a little bit more the screws here and there, but frankly, a lot of the screws that are loose are not, are not loose uh, 
uh, because the sanctions are not good enough. They are loose because some countries don't see the situation in Russia as we see it. Jim, do you agree? Is that as good as it gets, or would it be more effect effective? The, the we wouldn't even have to talk to these countries if we had secondary sanctions. Um, no, that's not the. It, <laughs> I, I, there, I think too many kind of false binaries in yeah. the question, which is probably why you're a great journalist. But the the I, um, I, I find it pretty I find it a pretty straightforward uh, choice. You can no, you can uh, force here, companies to comply, or you can you can talk to them. Here's the no. I, here's what I think is happening. So this, the sanctions and the export controls are clearly degrading the Russian military. Um, and so I just spent two days last week in Kazakhstan. So I'll talk a little bit about that, um, although it, it's a more nuanced picture because we believe in engagement. I've been to, so here's what happened. The war started, the G7 countries cut off exports to Russia of key electronics. Everything that's formally dual use, but also other things important for the military, like these integrated circuits, processors, chips. So we saw Russia's ability, they, they required like 90% of their semiconductors came from overseas, 70% of their integrated circuits, everything they bought, mostly from the G7, a little bit from China. So the first problem we found, and so for the six months last year, Russia no longer had access to this. So you ask why they don't bombard Kiev more every night, it's because they can't build the stuff to do it. That's a very real impact of sanctions. Now, it only really makes a difference when you combine it with providing actual air defense that's more sophisticated, right? But that's how you win the war. It's both those things. Right. So now, then we saw circumvention happening. What it was was our countries, the G7, started exporting a lot to a few countries. And there are a lot of countries listed, but the ones that had high volume was sort of Turkey, UAE, Kazakhstan, right? Big, and close to Russia. Okay, but the, actually, when you go under the hood, the story's very different because it was just a kind of flip and trade say, uh, uh, opportunity, I think, in Turkey and the UAE. So Turkey, as soon as we approached them with this and began to talk about the problems, we talked to them. And also, they know that we will look at the possibility of sanctions. But often, and this is where I don't want to focus too much on secondary sanctions, yeah. what I, you see is, well, sorry, I know you, but don't, the, don't the, walk back to the up. premise. You, 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 no, because, you, you're clearly a very good politician also because you didn't answer my question. <laughs> but um, it's fine. Let's ask a different question. How big is the problem actually of circumvention? Do you, do you have figures? It's so you've sizable. mentioned the countries. Well, um, well so okay, how big is it? We know it's a size, it's a substantial problem. That's why I'm going to Kazakhstan. That's why I'm going to Georgia, Armenia, other places. We have teams going out to Turkey and other places. Do you have any indicative so figures? Here's the number. What we know is that by the start of this year, um, Russia was able to reimport certain key categories of electronics at about pre-war levels. Now, how much of a problem was that? Well, it's clearly something we don't want to continue. One, Russia still faced a deficit because for most of 2022, it didn't have access to those items. Two, Russia is now running a war economy, so it should need many multiple times of these items that it, it was importing pre-war, right? Because they're blowing up the stuff they import. So, so the, the, and they don't have access to that. So how big a problem? It's a problem, but we also know Russia's ability to produce weapons is much hampered by the export controls and sanctions. Now, are we making progress? So well, the first thing we had to do was stop exporting this stuff ourselves. Because this trade, because it was not technically dual use, it was all legal. Yeah. So, so we could send it so to Kazakhstan. Like Australia. microchips and washing machines. It, or, all those things, yeah. right? So the first thing, the EU was first in the December package, 9th and the 10th package, plus the rest of the G7 followed in February. Now it's illegal for us to send those items when we think they're going for the benefit of Russia. The trade data always lags by a few months. We're seeing the numbers come down. But the second thing is then to engage with the key entrepot countries and say to them, you know, you know much of the trade here. Your, your economies are at risk. Most of your money comes from in dealing with Europe and the U.S. and Japan. So why are you putting it at risk for a few, you know, truckloads of these shipments? And what we saw was Turkey immediately put in restrictions that said we will not allow this, this re-export. 
Kazakhstan has put in place a whole new set of procedures, and we're starting to see a little bit of bend in the numbers. Um, UAE is, it's, is willing to act when it's confronted with specific information, um, and a number of other countries are beginning to put in place processes. So hopefully we see the numbers come down, and that's the benefit of engagement. Now, does it help if we can use sanctions? They're not always secondary. If we find a Russian official setting up a, a front company, that's not secondary. No, but, and, and, but this one is that they just set up, and it's a cat and cat Yeah, and yeah, you're just like, like yeah. but, but that's why it's so important to engage, because we want the customs policies of the countries to change. I had great conversations in Kazakhstan last week, and I think we'll see, the, we'll see a real bend happening there. But, and this is my final political point, This is also a part about what Secretary Blinken calls Russia's strategic failure. Part of what happened, this is different among all these countries. So part of what's happened with Kazakhstan is that global companies used to export to Russia and then the Russian subsidiary or recipient would distribute across Central Asia. Now they're exporting everything right to Kazakhstan. And Kazakhstan is distributing across Central Asia and also back into Russia where we have to be sure that what they're sending goes for legitimate purposes. So that will try to work to get under control. But this shift, now Russia's no longer the center of the economy in Central Asia. If that becomes a long-term trend, that is a massive strategic failure by Vladimir Putin. And so as we are working to try to reduce what we see as circumvention, we have to be sure we're not choking off the new economic reality that's emerging. Great. Thanks. Um, super interesting. I'd actually like to follow up, but we have to uh, open this. I want to open this up to questions from the public. Uh, yes. I don't know if we have microphones. Um, so there's one question here in the front. Um, Carolina Vigura, thank you so much for all those interesting remarks. I have been listening and thinking a little bit about the intellectual history of ECFR and our annual meetings. A couple of years ago, when the uh, tornado of black swans started to fly over our heads with populism first and then COVID pandemic and then last but not least, of course, war in Ukraine, we talked in ECFR about emotions and collective emotions of Europeans. And today we talk about trade, uh, and I could rephrase this, this, this title of the panel using some of, the, some of the notions that haven't been called today. You have been talking about risks and opportunities, and this is right, about rules and laws and legitimacy, and this is also right. But what about values? What do we know about um, what do the Europeans think about values? Because um, Jim, you have been saying rightly that we talk too much about things that divide us, that polarize us, and we should reach out to people saying, let's focus on what connects us, what joins us together. But isn't it difficult to do it in the time when some countries, at least some countries outside of Europe, but also inside Europe, actually do not adhere to the values of liberal democracy? and the rule of law and also the human rights. So I think it's a very important rephrase of this title of the panel. It's economic coercion in the future uh, global system and in the time of search for global values. Right. Of course, that, yeah. Jim, Jim, you have but been, you have been talking about it, but I would like perhaps anyone who could comment on, on this. What do you think, how we could include thinking about values in thinking about European societies and what the Europeans think about values and how they, how they differ about it and where, when do they think similarly. Thank you. Okay. Not too long? A bit Acceptable? long. Acceptable? It was, it, okay. I, I think it was more a point than That's a question, That's what happens right? when you, when you but, make a ask a, a, yeah. ask a question. I don't think it was really a question, but I, I, I get the point. We could have a, a separate panel on values. Um, does someone want to address it? <laughs> <laughs> Take a couple and then, okay. then we can hear. Um, uh, yes. And please uh, say your name and, and you work for. I'm Anne Linde. I'm the former foreign minister and minister of trade of Sweden. <laughs> Hello, Arantxa. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to pick up on something that Carl Bildt said because uh, being on the council meeting, off the council meeting, discussing sanctions and sanctions and try, uh, and getting the free trade to get smaller and smaller. And I know 
Arantxa is exactly on the same line. We are going in a direction where we are not putting enough uh, uh, innovation and, and growth activities and everything to make us stronger as Europeans and going in, I think, in a little bit the wrong direction because we are so threatened now with what's happening. So how can we change this and not get stuck in a, a discussion on sanction and uh, limiting free trade at the same time as we need to be stronger as uh, Europeans. And that's, I, I hear this whole discussion and it's, it's only about getting closer, yeah. getting so on, and that, that is a worrying thing. So I want you to, so, to reflect on that. So Thank the you. question is, um, how can we focus more on, on new free trade agreements? Um, the, how do we make ourselves stronger by growth and innovation and research and all this instead of making ourselves stronger by getting uh, more uh, more uh, looking into ourselves and getting all the discussion about sanctions and all the, the discussion about reducing our cooperation that's a tricky one it's so not an easy one economic security with diversification I'm also not sure it was a question, but we'll take <laughs> we'll take uh, another one. Um, yes, uh, there's a question here. Okay. My name is Razvan Nicolescu, and I'm the former Romanian energy minister. My question is about the title. So I stopped counting sanctions when I reached uh, uh, more than a hundred times was mentioned in the panel. But who does the power to control if the sanctions are applied in Europe? Is the European Commission? Is Politico? Uh, is the, are the national prosecutors? Uh, are the national uh, member states? The European prosecutor? Who does control? Are we sure that the sanctions are really applied? Okay. Um, yes. It's Heather Gravy. So what about sanctions on individuals? which we haven't talked about, the smart sanctions idea. Are these the best way of putting uh, the line in the sand that Arantxa was talking about? We've applied them to Russians, to Belarusians, to Iranians, back in the day to South Africans. Is scaring the individuals who wield power and the oligarchs more effective than trying to apply them to an economy? The second quick question is about the polling. Um, you've all pointed out that there are some quite nuanced views on de-risking. And that's actually quite sensible because we were able to get ourselves off dependence on Russian gas amazingly quickly, far more than anybody in Germany would have said, for example, was possible. But we can't decouple from China if we wish to decarbonize at the same time as de-risking. Uh, there's far too much dependency. I mean, we, we simply couldn't do it. We can't replicate those kinds of supply chains. So. Europeans may be quite uh, nuanced in their views, but what can politicians offer them as a really sophisticated way of de-risking over the years ahead when we can't simply friendshore and reshore those supply chains for decarbonizing? Okay, I think we have a few, yeah. Maybe I will, uh, I will start from uh, the minister's uh, question uh, saying that, no, it's not true. Maybe this panel, because the, uh, the title is uh, about economic coercion, so that's why we are focusing on, uh, on, uh, on sanctions, export control, and uh, different kind of instruments. But uh, uh, if you look what is happening on the trade agenda right now, it's, you know, we are having Australia, we're having New Zealand, we're having Mercosur. We negotiated that for, you know, better than me. We negotiated that for more than 10 years. Actually, so uh, so you know, it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's a bit probably unfair the pro the, the to, to say that uh, we don't uh, do enough. Well, we do enough. Maybe we can do even more. The thing is, if we trust our partners, because uh, the 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 part or the trade agreements or the deep and comprehensive trade agreements is about partnership. Is this the, one of the highest level of cooperation? And you have many more things. Uh, coupled with the trade agreements uh, as well, rule of law, a tie to the uh, to the international uh, uh, law and order, and so on and so forth, the climate, all all, all uh, human rights, and all, all all the things. I think that uh, you know 
through the trade agreements, through the deepening those uh, those cooperation, we are trying not really to close, but to, to widen uh, the area, hopefully, because it's uh, sometimes it's a pity, actually, to say that when our global partners saying one and not following the, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the, uh, their deeds. On, uh, on uh, uh, not... Uh, a, uh, not ability or it's that it's not possible to compare Russia and China and the risking is different. Well, but I really come back to the, to the public opinion poll. And uh, well, I hope we will not have this discussion uh, uh, soon uh, or any time, but I wonder if we will really would not speaking more about the risking and the coupling if China decided to wage a war. And then we'll definitely have US engagement in that. And then we will be facing the choice. And definitely the public opinion poll will probably even go further than we are seeing, uh, seeing, uh, seeing right now. Yeah, I want to uh, I want to address uh, Anne's point uh, because in reality, what the, the the question we have in front of us is finding a new balance between trade and security. When I started my career 25 years ago, trade czars had the upper hand over security hawks. And right now, security hawks have the upper hand over trade, no longer czars. Uh, in some part of the world, they don't even have trade res responsible so, or, or, or officials. Uh, but we clearly need to find a new balance. It's, and, and if I had to describe this balance, I would give it four points. Point number one, we certainly have to rebalance in favor of security because we have learned, and we've learned this the hard way, through COVID, uh, through conflicts, uh, through unreliable partners, that um, openness has to be punctuated with security concerns. That it's not one or, or the other, but that for trade to continue to work, we need to incorporate much more security concerns. The second point I would put is that this is about national security, capital N, capital S. It's not about competition. Because if everything is a national security issue, remember, we had a period where steel, aluminum, everything was about national security. This is not the discussion. The discussion is about national security, capital N, capital S. Number three, we also have to put into the equation that open markets and international trade can bring us security. This is the reason why the EU has done uh, an agreement, a trade agreement with Chile. Chile has a lot of lithium. We want to have access to that lithium. And the vehicle to do that is through a trade agreement. Number four, and this has fallen off our radar, we also have to put a bit of energy into international agreements on arms and weapons control. These four points can make the structure for a new compact uh, between uh, trade and security that will continue to let us use international trade for what it has been, at least in our uh, history, which is an amazing vehicle for innovation, for job creation, and for competitiveness. And this is where kudos also to the paper that ECFR Julian and uh, Tobias had put on the table because we need a new European strategy on economic security. Carl, I think you wanted to comment as well. Well, a couple of issues. I mean, I think it's fairly obvious what I've said previously that I, I, I share the worry that the debate is drifting under the heading of security too much in the direction of mercantilism and state capitalism, neither of which I think is a good thing for the future. So I, I, I think we have security absolutely is an issue, uh, but it's not the only issue. And uh, there's uh, the drift of the debate. We should be, we should be, we should be somewhat more careful. Heather had the issue of individual sanctions, and uh, certainly both Yim and I have been involved in that over the years in the Balkans. It's uh, should be it's it's an instrument should be done with care. Uh, you saw one of the 
complicating factors are the day with U.S. and Chinese. Uh, the U.S. had put individual sanctions on the Chinese defense minister. And then the U.S. Secretary of Defense wanted to meet with the Chinese defense minister. And he said, no, you have me under sanctions. While he met with the Europeans who doesn't have him under sanctions. I mean, from a, I mean, you're saying, I don't have a sing, single answer to it, but it shows the complex nature of the issue. With the Russians, I think we have been too much across the board. Uh, I have examples of people who are in opposition, not, not openly, but de facto actively in opposition, who have fled abroad and are forced back to Russia because they can't live in the West. They are forced back, they invited back to Russia and they have to go back to Russia because there's no way they can access a bank in the West. Is that wise? Not quite certain of that. I was in favor of doing sort of blanket in the beginning because we, didn't, we, we want to set a strong signal, but you need to be somewhat more selective. On the trade issue, I mean, we should be aware of on the Chinese competition, which is, of course, the key issue that is there ahead of us. The Chinese are very effective in their trade policies. You might have seen the figures in the FT yesterday on trade between China and Latin America. In two decades, it's expanded by a fact of 20. Fact of 20. Uh, they have the RCEP agreement, the biggest trade agreement in the world, with all of the Pacific world. Uh, they have applied to join CPTPP. Whether that will happen or not uh, is debatable. But they are pursuing an aggressive trade liberalization policy. And they are gaining trade partners all over the world. I, I normally use a figure, I hope Jim is correct, but I think there are 100 countries around the world that trade twice as much with China as with the US at the moment in goods. Um, and, and that translates over time into political influence. We must be then more aggressive in our trade policy, and that includes an uncomfortable aspect, which is difficult to handle in our particular access to our markets, uh, because we can't sort of demand access to their market if we don't give access to our markets. And then we have to fight with farmers and wine growers and whatever it is. But we have to do that uh, because that's in our long-term strategic interest. Final point just out of my experience, um, someone mentioned the COVID experience. I was involved with the, WO, uh, the WHO coordinating that. The biggest problem that we had in ramping up vaccine production across the world was trade restrictions. In the beginning of the pandemic, we had 150 trade restrictions. And for some reasons, they are secret. I mean, the WTO has a list. I don't know why it's not public, but it's there. Uh, it was roughly 150 across the world. Some of them fairly significant in terms of slowing things down. Um, and we managed to get that down to roughly 50. Took roughly a year of struggling with those particular countries. That is when we started to get vaccine product, when we want the global value chains up and running in markets that are often hyper-globalized. And I didn't know anything about vaccine production before. Nothing, nothing. Uh, now I know something. It is hyper-globalized. And if you cut it somewhere, it has an effect somewhere else. Um, so I would say one of the key things that we had in fighting the COVID and being at the end of the day successful in the vaccine production was opening up all of the global value chains everywhere and getting away with trade restrictions. That was quite a good experience and lesson for me. On that note, we've run out oh. of time. That's all the time oh, we got. Oh, but Jim needs, needs to say something. Um. Uh, okay, three points, because I'm between you and your coffee. One, uh, often sanctions reinforce the standards we're for, and that's my answer on values. So when we impose, many of our sanctions in Russia are against the people who are stealing children, stealing grain, committing atrocities. You know, we'll see what happens with the last day or two. And that sometimes does cut across other policy needs. But what we're trying to say is this is the community we are part of, and we stand by these values. The second thing, individual sanctions, Heather, I think are often important. I think a key element of them, though, is they should be tied to a nuanced understanding of the local political economy. So if you look at what we are doing in the Western Balkans now, particularly in Bosnia, I'll just say a lot of the political leaders, I don't know if they are actually secessionist and nationalist so that they can be rich, or if they need to get rich so they can carry out a secessionist campaign. Uh, 
The money is something I can get at. So we are looking at the people who fund the criminal networks, the bag men who carry it out, the state procurement scams, those things so that they can't be rich on the backs of being nationalists. And I think that changes their political calculations. Other kinds of sanctions, individual sanctions may not be much. Um, the third thing, to the minister's question about sanctions implementation, it is an area we spend a lot of time on. We need everyone down to the compliance officer in a company and the customs guy standing at a border to understand what is allowed. But, and here's the more fundamental point we can close on. We have to be sure that we're providing alternatives for, for people in these markets. If we say you're no longer allowed to trade with your longtime trading partner, and we're not gonna give you anywhere else to go, then we're in a battle trying to hold the water on the other side of the dike. I realize it's a horrible metaphor right now. But the, what we need to do is kind of create markets and create options, and that's why I keep coming back to the importance of the sort of framework that, that Arach is discussing. We're no longer in the world of more trade is good trade or tight national security restrictions. We have to recognize that security means people have to be able to live and live well at home. And that is what will allow us to, to have a solid popular base for our, um, for our foreign policy. And so a piece of what we're doing with redirecting value chains by using sanctions or export controls in the case of Russia is redirecting them in a way that will be sustainable and that will allow people to feel a, a broader sense of security in where they live. And that lowers the risk that they will go off and try to violate the sanctions in a way that will allow Russia to continue its war. Thanks. Um, now we really have run out of time, but um, it was super interesting. Um, we now have a 45 minute coffee break and then we're back with ECFR's inside session on the Turkish elections. Um, so at 15.45. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>